Hi, this is Kate Crowley, Professor of Practice here at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. Welcome to Module 7, Apraxia, Diagnosis and Treatment. This is a module as part of a module series called Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Evaluations, What Every EI Evaluator in New York City Needs to Know. This is um, part of a series I did of uh, trainings I did for the New York City Department of Health for Early Inter Bureau of Early Intervention in March and April of 2016. And people wanted to see it who couldn't get there, and those who went there wanted to review some of the materials, so we decided to put this together as a module series. So what is apraxia? Apraxia is a motor speech disorder. Children with childhood apraxia of speech have problems saying sounds, syllables, and words. It's not because of muscle weakness or paralysis. It's not. The brain has problems planning in the movement of the body parts, meaning the lips, tongue, and jaw. So motor planning issues needed for speech. So what are the diagnostic indicators of apraxia with young children? So they have difficulty achieving and maintaining articulatory configurations. There's a presence of vowel distortions, limited consonant and vowel repertoire, Use of simple syllable shapes and difficult completing a movement gesture for a phoneme easily produced in simple context, but not in a longer context. So you can see that most of these features are also consistent with development, development of typical development of children. So one of the things is very difficult to really come up with a good diagnosis of childhood apraxia of speech. So there is great concern among speech language pathologists and others regarding the overdiagnosis or misdiagnosis of childhood apraxia of speech. Specifically, it is questioned as to whether children under age three should be even given the diagnosis of apraxia of speech, and if so, when. So here, as you, many of you watching this know, apraxia is one of those conditions that speech pathologists can identify and diagnose that will lead the child to have actually have uh, be eligible for services. The problem is we have an epidemic of childhood apraxia of speech in New York as a result, which says that evaluators are not doing a good job of evaluating or evaluators are using it to qualify children that would do not qualify. It's a very serious situation for our field. So here's a praxia, praxia evaluation of 24 months. <clears throat> it's important to note her performance on the receptive section of the reel is judged to be somewhat of an underestimation of her actual receptive language skills. Of additional and significant note is the fact that there is greater than one full standard deviation between the receptive and expressive language skills with an expressive language deficit evident. The problem is, if this evaluator had understood about standard error of measurement in the reel, they would see there is not one full standard deviation between the two scores. They actually overlap. So here's a lot of language on a slide, but I'm just going to walk you through it. This was at New York City Department of Health EI Apraxia Evaluation. I've read many, many of these, and each one makes me sad. Every now and then you see a bright light, but there's a lot of great tears shedding for our profession. So here's a 24-month-old. The child presented as a somewhat verbal child whose output consisted of jargon and words. Most of what she said was unintelligible, even to her mom. Based on parent report, he has an expressive vocabulary of 15 true words as well as additional word approximations. So I say, which ones? List them. How is a word approximation different from a true word at 24 months? Is it ba for bottle? Is it ka for car? Those are true words. List the words that are unintelligible without a share of reference. So the child might say beeb, beb, bebe for boo boo, or idi for freidi, her sister, emo for elmo. I, I submit those are developmentally appropriate. That doesn't, that doesn't make me worried at all with a 24 month old. Although within her jargon, she presented with a variety of sounds, which ones? Within words, multiple omissions, substitutions, and distortions were noted. That sounds like articulation, not like apraxia. But at least give me two examples of each. You've got to give me examples. Where's your data? 
Her primary method of communication was via gestures, pointing, and use of some word approximations. Again, word approximations, tell me what you're talking about, make that come to life. Use of gestures to assist in communication were evident. I don't know if you've been watching any of these modules, but I use gestures to assist in communication, and I don't think I have a language problem. Imitative skills were weak. I'm not sure what that means, because she couldn't do this or this, or she couldn't repeat. I don't know. While she would sometimes spontaneously attempt to imitate, well, typically did not come out correctly, give me an example. How do you spontaneously imitate? Imitation on command was very difficult for her. Is it because it's a speech problem, a motor problem? She doesn't know why you're asking her to do this stuff? And difficulty motor planning verbal output on command was evident. Which ones? How? Give examples. So this evaluation should just be tossed out. A child deserves a much better evaluation than this. This does not tell me anything. And this is different from the evaluation right before. Here's another evaluation. This is a 24 month old or do speaker, again, different than the other two before. Um, so this person did not do the Kaufman because it's an Urdu speaker. Hmm. Well, I don't know why you'd always do the Kaufman anyway. So the child's behaviors were compared against the list of characteristics of developmental apraxia of speech found in the Diagnostic Criteria of Developmental Apraxia of Speech used by clinical speech language pathologists. And this is part of an article in the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology, a very well considered article. So what I do when I see something like that is I go find the article. So I went into the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology and I did find the article. You can all look for it. It's right there. Very short article. That article it wasn't the diagnostic criteria of speech. It was a survey of speech language pathologists in a state association convention meeting where they were asked to write down three criteria for a proxy of speech. That wasn't supposed to be the rule now. Here's a pra Some of those people may not have known a proxy, and part of the article says some of this was pretty far off, but it's likely because they might not, they might have come because they wanted to learn about it and they didn't know. But this evaluator takes that, what's in that article, and says, this is what I'm going to be looking for, which has nothing to do with the research on apraxia. Well, we'd be lucky if it did. Maybe a couple of people knew. Inconsistent productions. Now, unable to imitate sounds. I just would like you to look at, this is an Urdu speaker, and all of the examples are in English. Low phonemic inventory. Uh, uh, is that in English? Is that in Urdu? Vowel errors. Be and I and by. Be and by. Sometimes 24 months old say things that do distort their vowels. They're not really distorting. They're just not 100% correct yet because they're little kids learning how to do it. Again, here we have expressive, worse, and receptive. And um, you're always going to expect that a kid's expressive skills are going to be worse than their receptive skills, right? I don't know how you use the Rossetti for an Urdu speaker, but this person obviously did. The cultural and linguistically appropriate evaluation would not use the Rossetti. Once you start, have a look at the earlier modules, you wouldn't use the Rossetti for many reasons for an Urdu speaker. Anyway, this is just an example of a very poor identification of apraxia. First, the child spoke Urdu, and there's no examples of Urdu. Second, we have no information about Urdu sounds. Third. They used diagnostic criteria that wasn't meant to be a, a standard for diagnostic criteria. And fourth, they used the Rossetti, which is certainly not a culturally and linguistically appropriate test. Here's a couple of videos of a little boy if you want to have a look at them with apraxia. So how do you write a good apraxia evaluation? If you, um, I actually did the two year, 10 month old that you've seen throughout these videos, Alex. I did evaluate him and I came up with a diagnosis of developmental apraxia. Now, I'm going to read you what I wrote about him. While Alex can produce all the phonemes that would be expected for his age, his speech language impairment lies in the coordination and placement of the sounds within a word, of omission and addition of syllables, and even of words and sentences. For example, he named his favorite toy Thomas the Tank as Thomas Chen Chen, Chen Chen, and Thomas the Ten. And for, so it varied. And, and for the name of the book, Click Clack Boo, he variously described the book as Kick Cack Boo, which is fine developmentally. It's just um, 
uh, cluster reductions, and chi chabu. So there we have vowel changes and cluster changes and single sound changes. An example, now here's an example of the syllable addition was in how he said the sentence, farmer locks the door, and he said, farmer brown walked doi. While the deletion of the R and WR substitutions are age appropriate, the addition of the syllable closing the word door to have two syllables is not typical. So what I did is I took what I had heard and I then applied it to the characteristics of childhood apraxia of speech, and I gave you my examples. A final example occurred when the evaluator read Alex the book from head to toe. In that book, there was a movement made and the child is asked, can you do it? And the child responds, I can do it. First, the, during the first read through the book, Alex hesitated greatly in saying, I can do it. His repetitions of the sentences were so variable that it was often difficult to realize he was attempting to say, I can do it. Each time was different and greatly variable in length and number of syllables and the phonemes used. The second time the book was read, however, Alex waited for the evaluator to give him the prompt of I and to give him some intonation prompts, I, uh, uh, and to tap out the syllables on his arm. When the story was read a second time, Alex had all the words in place and had only occasional minor variability in the first phoneme and last phoneme. This indicated that Alex has great potential for a multisensory approach has high modifiability and is stimulable. One of the things about Alex that I will tell he had developmental apraxia of speech. However, he was not significant enough to qualify for early intervention services. I also realized because I worked with the mom and the child, not I, and I worked with the mom and the child by phone and by email and by Skyping, uh, FaceTime more than Skyping, and I gave her things to do when she was a school psychologist. She did them, and the child's speech resolved so that I, within a year, his speech was normal. It, no, no variability, beautiful motor, um, motor speech -ish, uh, development, beautiful production. And what I realized was my diagnosis was wrong. He didn't qualify. He didn't have significant enough delay. It was mild. But my diagnosis of childhood apraxia of speech was wrong because it resolved itself within a year completely. And you wouldn't really have that in child apraxia of speech. So I would urge you all to think about, read about childhood apraxia of speech, see how to make it come to life in the evaluations where you give true examples, and really think about the epidemic of apraxia and which profession or professions is responsible for that. You can see this entire evaluation and receive free ASHA CEUs at leadersproject.org. Now I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about treatment. What we found is in many of the apraxia um, evaluations and also in the, the IFSP goals for um, these children with apraxia, they ask for non-speech oral motor exercises. Do not approve, this is for the EIODs, do not approve goals for children with apraxia of speech that involve blowing horns, sucking on straws, chewing on various chew toys, or massage. These non-speech oral motor exercises have no relation to speech production. In fact, SLP should not be doing non-speech oral motor exercise for any speech and or language delays. The parts of the brain that control movements of speech are different from the parts that control non-speech movements. These exercises are not needed to warm up the mouth for speech. Limited strength is needed to speak, so a warm-up is not necessary. Sadly, the use of whistles, Z-vibes, toothettes, chewy tubes, horns, straws, talk tools, and massages to address speech and language delays is widespread in New York City speech language pathology EI services. It's very discouraging. These children deserve better. They have a limit. If EI is going to help them, they have a small window to get that help. And all of this stuff is not going to help speech or language delays. So no more non-speech oral motor exercise goals to address speech or language delays. Please don't get your information off of promotional websites or Facebook. There's a lot of misinformation spread on Facebook about this. It's just look at the research. You can download comments on how to answer parent questions about non-speech oral motor exercises at leadersproject.org. We have that in Spanish and English. This change needs to happen in the trenches. So now we've finished our seventh module. 
We've gone through the entire D New York City Department of Health training on culturally and linguistically appropriate evaluations, what every EI evaluator in New York City needs to know. I hope you have found it useful. Um, again, uh, you can find additional information at leadersproject.org. That's all free, um, available for anybody who wants to learn more about disability evaluation, a number of different topics, but the ones you'll be looking at for this is under disability evaluations, that drop-down menu, and then if you want to get the free CEUs uh, under CEUs. So it's a pleasure, and um, I look forward to seeing you all in the field.